worked on the HP Jacobs mural last time together. This time we're going to be talking about uh, some of the remarkable women uh, in Ypsilanti's history. And uh, this is going to be the subject of our next mural. This woman you're looking at right here, her name is Euphemia McQuan. And she is the great granddaughter of one of the first African American women to ever come to Ypsilanti. A woman we'll meet in a moment named Isa Stewart who escaped from slavery. So this is how old some of our traditions in Ypsilanti are. I mean, we're looking at this old picture of this woman from the 1890s, and she's already been in Ypsilanti with her great-grandmother. So she's been in here, Ypsilanti, her family's already been here for 60 years, and this is over 100 years ago. We're going to think a little bit about how to think of history. History is not the past. I know that people get bored and say, why do I have to know anything about what happened in the past? The fact is that it didn't just happen in the past. All of us here live with what the past has given us. We all live with history every single day. So the past is not past. It's utterly present. Just the way in your family, you are raised by your parents, right? And your parents were raised by people with ideas. And the way those ideas, maybe from your great-grandparents, who you never knew, you get, you learn from your parents. So that's the way history moves in all of us. History is a part of all of us. None of us are separate from it. And then let's talk about individuals and big history, because we're going to be looking at individuals here. But you cannot tell the story of history through an individual. That's a personal story. But if we really look at individuals' histories, we're going to find within their story all kinds of other stories. We're going to find stories of many different people, and we're going to find stories of the time that they lived in. We are all products of the time we live in. So when we look at these women and we're going through their stories, think about the time that they lived in, the people that they knew, the activities that they were part of. All of that history informs who they are and then informs what they pass down to us. So we live in this world made in the past, and that means when we make a world, we're going to hand it down to other people too. So we are always engaged in history, whether we're thinking about it or not. We're modifying the past all the time, and we're handing it to the future all the time, whether we're thinking about it or not. So history is not separate from our general lives, from how we live life. It's part of us all of the time. And if you want to understand how we live, the way we live, you have to understand history. There's no way other than that. Remember us talking about Euphemia McQuan at the beginning and her great-grandmother? Well, that woman's name was Isa Stewart. Let's look at Isa Stewart here. So she was born in 1805, and she died in 1894. How old would that make her? 89. 89 years old. So she lives through almost a century, the entire 19th century, Isa Stewart lives under. She's going to found, does anybody recognize this church? This church is on South Adams and Buffalo Street. It's called Brown Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And she is one of the founders of this church. Um, she's going to give the land that this church is on in the 1840s. So let me just read you a little bit about uh, Isis Stewart. And again, think about how history is passed down, remember? So here is a newspaper article. Uh, talking about Isis Stewart after she's dead, and it is Levi McQuan, her grandson, and the father of the woman we saw in that first slide. Let me just read you uh, what this says. Um, you all have heard of Harriet Tubman, correct? Yes. We know, uh, did Harriet Tubman ever come to Ypsilanti? No, she did not, but we have a statue of her, don't we? Why do, we, why do you think we have a statue of Harriet Tubman in Ypsilanti? Because we want to celebrate Harriet Tubman. We want to celebrate people like Harriet Tubman. The fact is, Ypsilanti has our own Harriet Tubmans. We have the kind of women that Harriet Tubman was. Isis Stewart is one of them. She was born into slavery in Virginia. She came to Ypsilanti escaping slavery. So let's read this newspaper article and think about history and how it passes down from generation to generation. So Levi McQuan has two relics of slavery days that he prizes very highly. One is a corn knife that is gilded and hangs in his parlor. It has a history connected with his grandmother, Mrs. Isa Stewart, who was a slave in Virginia. She was a determined colored woman who, when she ran away, said she would never be taken alive. That sounds like Harriet Tubman. She had a particularly narrow escape in Reading, Pennsylvania, where the slave hunters were on her trail. They even came to the house where she was, but the disguise given her by her friends helped to mislead them. 
At another time, while in the mountains, she met five panthers. I don't, actually don't think panthers uh, hunt in packs. They're individuals. So, but the, it's not one, two, three, or four panthers, but five panthers she meets. So that might be a bit of an exaggeration. She always kept this core knife with her, and she would have used it if necessary. The other relic is a conch horn, and that's a horn made out of a shell, used on the plantations. This she used very effectively one night when 25 men surrounded her home in Ypsilanti. And my guess is this is a racist attack on her home. When she refused them admittance and they threatened to break down her house door, she rushed for the horn and from the second story window gave some blasts on it, which made the showmen think that the day of Jubilee had arrived. It is reported that the way men, the men tumbled over each other to get away is the most lofty tumbling ever seen in Ypsilanti. So you see how these stories, she, Isis Stewart's dead, um, and her grandson is holding on to these stories about her mother, in, or his grandmother in slavery. And not just the stories, but the items. You know, you invest these items with all this history. So Isis Stewart's son, she's old enough that her son fights in the Civil War, not her husband. Her son fights in the Civil War, a guy named Jesse Stewart, and he would be participate in something called Potter's Raid, which would liberate 2,000 slaves in 1865 in South Carolina when he was in the army. So Isis Stewart's son engaged in the kind of activities that Harriet Tubman engaged in, but in the Civil War on a huge, grand scale. And then Isis Stewart's daughter, her first daughter, uh, anybody here ever heard of Elijah McCoy? Yes. Elijah McCoy? So her first daughter is Elijah McCoy's first wife. She dies young and Elijah will remarry, but we'll meet uh, Elijah later. So. Isis Stewart has tons of families still in this area. Um, and her history goes all the way back to the 1830s in Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti is founded in 1824. And we know that there are black women and women in general in Ypsilanti from the beginning. So think that the story of women and of black women starts in Ypsilanti when Ypsilanti starts. It's not a separate story. It's not a separate story. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper is not from Ypsilanti, but she visited Ypsilanti. And she was maybe the most famous black woman of her time. She was a writer. She was a political activist. Um, she was many different things. And she spoke at Brown Chapel here, the African American church on South Adams in Buffalo, in 1874. And what did she speak on? When, when did slavery end? When did slavery end, everybody? Ooh. 1865, okay? 1865, slavery ends in this country, and a few years later, black men get the right to vote. What about women? When did women get the right to vote in this country? Hmm? Ooh, later than that. Pretty close, pretty close. So, so about 1920, women get the right to vote. So we're talking, we're talking 12, 50 years before women get the right to vote about. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper comes to Ypsilanti, and she has this meeting, Equal Rights Demand That Women Vote. And she's saying, we just fought slavery. And we fought for men to get the vote. And now, black men, it is time for you to stand up for women to get the vote. So she says, every colored man and woman uh, felt, felt the remarks, uh, full force of her remarks as she portrayed how, when the dark shadow of slavery rested upon them mutually, and they mutually suffered, and now being free, the justice and necessity of both men and women clinging and rising together. This was here in Ypsilanti. 1874, 50 years before women get the right to vote, Ypsilanti, African American Methodist Episcopal Church, is demanding women get the right to vote. Helen Walker McAndrew. So Helen Walker McAndrew is a really remarkable woman here in Ypsilanti. She's not born here. She's, you can tell she's a white woman. She's born in Scotland. She comes to uh, the United States in the 1840s with her husband, and they become radical anti-slavery activists around Baltimore. For some reason, I think because they're hiding people and stuff like that, they have to leave Baltimore. It gets too dangerous for them. And they come to Ypsilanti, and Helen looks at Ypsilanti in the 1850s. Remember, slavery's still here, but we're starting to get people fleeing slavery from the South and coming to Ypsilanti. And what she decides is that one of the things that people most need, that women need, that poor people need, that African Americans need, is access to medical care. People don't have medicine. They don't have hospitals. They don't have just basic services like that. 
So Helen becomes the first woman doctor, maybe in Michigan, certainly in Washtenaw County, in 1855 and opens a home. This is the house. And it's on South Huron Street, where the parish um, in Bed and Breakfast is now. It's 105 South Huron Street. And she calls it the Rest for the Weary. And this is a home that cared for women, children, and the city's large African-American population. So if any of you have family who lived here for a long time, there's chances that your great-grandparents were born in this home and born by Helen McAndrew. And Helen was deeply involved in the anti-slavery and the women's rights movement here. Her, you know, I hear so many stories about the Underground Railroad in Ypsilanti, and almost all of them are kind of myths and not true. But there are many stories about her, Helen and her husband, William McAndrew, getting slaves to freedom in Canada through Trenton. So we have real concrete information about the work that they did on the Underground Railroad. But that's not all she was involved in at all. That was part of her struggle for human rights for everybody. So she, has anybody heard of uh, Susan B. Anthony? Very famous women's rights activists. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, very famous women's, these are national activists. They would all come to Ypsilanti and stay at her house there in South Tucson. She was part of this women's activist community. We think of political activists being in the 1960s and 70s. Well, she was in the 1860s and 70s. This is what her son wrote about Helen McAndrew and her, fa and, uh, her husband after they died. He said, they marched in the streets in their old age with the same grim determination to back up some despised reform that they showed for abolition when it wasn't respectable, for women doctors when they were despised, for temperance when it was unpopular, and for women's suffrage when it was ridiculous. So at some point, women's suffrage, the idea that women would have the right to vote, was ridiculous in this country. The same way just 10 years ago, the idea that gay people could get married was ridiculous in this country. It takes people to say, no, it's not ridiculous. I have those rights. I demand those rights. And people like Helen McAndrew, she didn't see, she didn't see women get the right to vote, did she? She didn't see it. There's no way that, because she didn't see it, that it meant any less to her. Go ahead. Where did you say she came from? Again? Scotland, originally from Scotland. Okay, so she dies in 1906, and unfortunately this home is not there anymore, but we're going to take a walking tour and see where that home was. It's a really important place. Um, I think everybody called her like Dr. Helen or something. She was um, a very important woman in the community, especially for poor people, working people, African American people, and women. She took women's health seriously. You know what, how, what was the leading cause of death for women back in these days? Do you guys know? Pregnancy. You died in childbirth. You died in childbirth. And so um, the most important thing you could have for a woman was to have good care when you were pregnant and when you were giving birth. That would ensure your survival and the baby's survival. And so that was extremely important to give people a fair chance at life. And she uh, demanded that and she made it for people. She didn't just demand it. She made it herself. Wealthus Sherman was the matriarch of Ypsilanti's black community from about 1870 until, look when she dies, 1942. How old does that make her? 1850 to 1942? How old? 98. Why? 92. 92. So 92 is pretty old. And imagine what she sees. So she's born before the end of slavery. She dies during World War II. That's a huge lifespan. Imagine all of the things she saw in her life. She also has a window down at uh, uh, Brown Chapel Amy Church. And here is a picture of her as a young girl in Ypsilanti. Don't find many pictures of African American women in Ypsilanti in the 1900s. Very few. Here's one. Mm -hmm. What church was the window at? This is at Brown Chapel AME. And Wealth, uh, has anybody, does anybody know what that church looks like? It's brick and all of that? Wealth of Sherman went around with a wheelbarrow to gather bricks and nails and all of that kind of stuff. She actually built that with her parishioners. That church was built by people like Wealth of Sherman. She was so important to the community that uh, in her old age, she's given a huge celebratory event at Harriet Street School, Harriet Street School. And the woman who gives, who emcees that event is Bernice Kersey. So we're going to see generations of women uh, active together. So here is Wealth of Sherman. Here she is in old age. She was born in Canada 
Her parents had escaped from slavery. She comes to Ypsilanti like so many people after the end of the Civil War. She lived on South um, Washington Street. Elijah is going to marry Mary McCoy, Mary or Mary Delaney. Mary is not from Ypsilanti originally, but she comes and uh, lives in Ypsilanti for decades. I don't know why she came to Ypsilanti. I would love to know that. She went to Friedman, a Friedman School, so a school for ex-slaves in St. Louis. But I don't think she was born into bondage. I think that she was uh, born a free woman uh, in Indiana. In fact, she was born um, in a uh, abolitionist stronghold on the Ohio River uh, called Rip, or, um, Richmond, Indiana. So Mary McCoy becomes really exemplary of kind of black women because she creates clubs and institutions that are going to take care of black women because this is before we have things like unemployment insurance or welfare or anything that would take care of you if times were tough. You were just on your own. So people had to gather together their own resources, create their own societies to help each other out when they were sick or help each other out when there was a funeral or help each other out when they needed to get a loan. So people created societies like that because we had segregation. And Mary created so many different societies, many of which are still here today. Have you guys heard of Sojourner Truth? Yeah. Sojourner Truth? She also came to Ypsilanti all the time. She's over here in, in Battle Creek. Mary Delaney founds the, is the president of the Sojourner Truth Memorial Association. And that's established to give scholarships to the children of former slaves. And she also founded the McCoy Home for Colored Children. And it's an orphanage. Uh, and daycare center. Remember, this is before we have daycare or kindergarten or anything for women, black women who are domestic servants. So if you were a black woman around 1900, you had two options for a job. Domestic servant, cook. Here's your options. It didn't matter how smart you were. didn't matter how intelligent and good looking you were. Cook, domestic servant. And Mary um, wanted to make sure that those children were taken care of that those children had access to something. So she founded the McCoy Home for Colored Children in Detroit. She also founded the Phyllis Wheatley Home for Aged Colored Women. All of these really important institutions, some of which are very much still active, were founded by a woman who lived where the Michigan Avenue Public Library is right now. One of the things she founded is the Palm Leaf Club. The Palm Leaf Club is an organization of African American women here in Ypsilanti that's been around since 1904. This picture is taken in the 1950s, and these are the grandchildren of the original founders of the Palm Leaf Club. And today, the great-grandchildren of these women are the leaders of the Palm Leaf Club. So we have generations of generations of generations of women. And the Palm Leaf Club does things like get scholarships for students, um, it uh, does clothing drives and food drives, all manner of sort of public service. And they have a clubhouse on South Washington as well. And I can't remember the name of the ad or the address now. Laura, do you? But it's still, the, the home is still there, and they're still active in the Palm Leaf Club. And this club was founded by Wealtha Sherman. Some of you may have relatives who are in the Palm Leaf Club. Now, when, we, when I came in here to talk about H.P. Jacobs, we, we were still working on some names and trying to figure out some ideas about him, and I found where this name Jacobs come from. So remember he was born in slavery, his name is Samuel Hawkins, and when he gets to the Canadian, the river, the Detroit River, he sheds his slave name, he gets baptized as H.P. Jacobs. And I've always, well, who is this Jacobs? Who is this name he's taking? Jacobs is the name of his wife. He's taking Louise Jacobs, his wife's name. So that means that I thought his daughters, who keep the name Jacobs, were honoring their father by keeping their maiden name Jacobs. They're honoring their mother by keeping their maiden name Jacobs. So who is this woman, Louise Jacobs? We know very little about her because she dies young, and she's a woman before women are allowed to vote. She's a black woman born into slavery, so there's not a lot of records about her. But she, we know she must have been so important if HP takes her name if her children, well after she is dead, continue to honor her with, with keeping her name. Now even today, it's kind of unusual for women to keep their family name and not take their husband's name. But back then, it was extremely unusual. And that's what these women did. So when we think about H.P. Jacobs, we think about this man, this very strong man. But look at the women in his life. Mary Deal, Dill, it was his mother. We don't know anything about her except that she lived on the plantation for her entire life, even after the end of slavery. 
We have Louisa, his wife, but we know her name is on all the deeds, for all the churches, for all the schools, for everything. Louisa is there at every point next to her husband as a co-owner, as a co-signer for all of these things. And then after she dies, Louisa dies about 18, uh, we don't know exactly, maybe 1871, two, three, in Mississippi. Anna, the youngest daughter, who's just about 20, or the oldest daughter, who's 20 years old, takes over as the mother of the family. And so as 20 years old, she has to raise all of her younger children. She has to take care of her father and do all of that. Didn't stop all of these children, all of the daughters of H.P. Jacobs becomes mus musicians. Every one of the daughters of H.P. Jacobs goes to music school and becomes a musician. And Julia lives all the way until 1952 here around Ypsilanti. And they would have, um, and that not just their, his daughters, but his granddaughters. Miss Allie Louise de Hazen is the granddaughter of H.P. Jacobs. And we see here she left Saturday morning for St. Clair Flats where she's going to play in the summer at a hotel. She becomes a pianist. And she'll play all over. Allie de Hazen has returned from Merview where she has been playing during the summer. She becomes a, a really famous pianist around here. And she would have learned piano right in that room. We have all these, I mean, imagine that, going from born in slavery on a plantation to being a classical pianist within about 15 years. How different your life was. Anna was born in bondage. She was born on a plantation. And at the end of her, by 40 years old, she is a classically trained musician living here in Atlanta teaching. Okay, so Miss Anna Chalmers Alexander's Nags. And here, you're going to note, look at all those names, too. Are you, notice all these women are keeping a couple of names. The way that feminists do now, they'll keep their name. Well, feminists back then were doing it and it was much less likely for you to do it then. So when you see a woman doing it back then, you think this woman must have had a little chutzpah, right? She had a little going on. So Miss Anna Chalmers, that's her name. She's a white woman, right? Here she is, she's the teacher. This is the old First Ward School down on South Adams Street, the segregated school where all African-American children would have to go. But Anna Chalmers Alexander, her parents were abolitionists. Her parents weren't just any white folks. They were involved in the anti-slavery movement. And that clearly must have affected her, because even though she's born after the end of slavery, she lives on the south side of Ypsilanti. She's a member of Brown Chapel AME. A white woman is a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She's uh, the head of the choir of the AME. And she has, and she lives on the south side, and she works at the black school, and even a a directory of important black school teachers in Michigan chooses to include her because of her um, uh, importance to the black community here in Ypsilanti. Her name is Lady Bountiful. But look at how this history works again. So she wasn't born during slavery. She wasn't born during that struggle, but it clearly informed her entire life, didn't it? She had to have been thinking about that. It was a continuation of what her parents had done. So history lives on in all of us. What our parents do lives on and determines what we do and how we think about the world. And that's clearly true for Miss Anna Chalmers Alexander Nags. And she, what does this say to, here too? Women to vote on suffrage next spring. So not only is she defending the African American community and working with the African American community, she is a vehement activist for women's rights and women's suffrage. Unfortunately, Miss Nags is killed accidentally in a train wreck, hits her car, where the Walgreens is up by Prospect, you know, where there's the train tracks that go under there. There's a bridge over it now. There didn't used to be a bridge, and her car got stuck in the tracks, and she was killed. She's buried, uh, um, very interestingly, next to the kind of abolitionist plot up in Highland Cemetery, where some of the leading abolitionist families are buried. Bernice Kersey is the last teacher at that school. And here she is here. Here she is here, and here she is as an older woman. Bernice Kersey uh, was the last teacher at that school. Uh, she is the woman who uh, gave Wealtha Sherman her big celebration. And she is chosen by the community with her brother Herman to lead the campaign to desegregate Ypsilanti's schools in like 1917, 1918. Remember, this is Martin Luther King is not even alive yet. This is a decade before he's even born that uh, they're working on this activity here in Ypsilanti. And Bernice is just a young woman. Look how young she is. She's a couple years older than you guys here when she's chosen to lead the campaign against segregation along with her brother. But she can't vote, right? Because she's a woman. So her brother is going to have to lead the legal challenge, uh, the public legal challenge, and the voting rights challenge. So they're going to put it uh, on ballots and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, eventually, 
Um, she, here's uh, Ruth Sykes Penn, Bernice Kersey, and this is uh, Jeffrey St. Clair Price, who is the former dean of Howard University, where, where you went. And here is Bernice and her sister Nina. And we are going to meet Nina's daughter, Rolanda Kersey. Bernie, Bernice Kersey and is the, the Kersey family are really famous in Ypsilanti. They have a house here at 329 First Avenue. It's a little pink house on First Avenue, right when you go up on your left. And th they all grew up here. Everybody you're seeing grew up there. And Nina's daughter, Rolanda, still lives in that home, built by her grandfather, these women's father, in the 1890s. So when we go there, you're going to walk into a museum, basically. The Kerseys have been living in that home since the 1890s, generation after generation. The pictures are still up from Canada. The pictures are still up from the 1800s when we go in there. So we're looking at generations after generations of women in Ypsilanti. And what we're going to ask Rolanda, start thinking about questions about the Kersey family, what it was like to grow up. In, uh, in segregation and Jim Crow time, to go to segregated schools. What it was like to live on First Avenue at that time. What it was like to work around here. All of those questions we can ask her. Because she's going to be a living witness to history that is 100 years old. She's going to know that and have seen it. What a resource to be able to talk to her about. Bernice also has a window at Brown Chapel AME, uh, which she was a member of. A lot of women are also early members of Second Baptist. So if you guys know Second Baptist, Church, this is also a really early church, and that's the church H.B. Jacobs founded. She is the ch child, the daughter of abolitionists. She's born uh, right at the end of the Civil War, so she's not an abolitionist, but her parents were, so they must have been saying something to her, because she lives on the south side of Ypsilanti, she lives on Buffalo, she goes to Brown Chapel AME, she goes to the African Methodist Episcopal Church, she's in the AME choir, and she teaches at the First Ward School. So she is a white woman who's completely immersed in the black community of the South Side. And she is, she's called Lady Bountiful, because she, like Wealthless Sherman, you know, this is a, a deprived community. This is an oppressed community. This is a community where you don't have a lot of that. There's not even sewage in the South Side of Ypsilanti until the 1950s. So you really have to do for yourself. And this is the old school room. So what you're looking at is an actual picture of the old segregated school room down on South Adams Street. These are all, all the African American children. If you were born at that time, you're African American in Ypsilanti, you had one choice of where you were going to go to school, and that was at the old First Ward School. But look, she's also, not only is she an anti-racist and somebody incredibly involved in the education of children, she's also working on women's suffrage. So this is, again, 12, 50 years after we saw Francis Harper come to Ypsilanti to work on suffrage. We still have people working on suffrage. They didn't give up. They didn't give up. That's why you guys will have the vote when you're 18. Um, so there, she was so important that Michigan did a directory of important black teachers all the way back in 1907. And uh, it was a black publication. And they make a special uh, special notice for her, even though she's white. They're saying, okay, this is somebody who deserves to be in this book as well. And you, if you look on the website, South Adam Street, you can read all about the old First Ward School and Anna Chalmers Alexander and the campaign around that. Um, but you can read more about her. She's another remarkable person. And again, um, she dies not too long after this photo is taken. She's hit by a train where Prospect is in Michigan Avenue, you know, where the CVS, you know, Walgreens up uh, the hill there on Prospect in Michigan. She was, she was killed there with her second husband. Okay, so Bernice Kersey. Anybody ever heard of the Kersey family here in Ypsilanti? Lots of Kerseys in Ypsilanti. Uh, remember me telling you about Wealtha Sherman before? The young woman who gave the big uh, commemoration for Wealtha Sherman was Bernice Kersey. So we see these generations and generations working. So Bernice Kersey is a teacher here in Ypsilanti. She's an African-American woman teacher, and she teaches at the old First Ward School, which is a segregated school. So Ypsilanti had officially segregated schools for a long time. Um, the last campaign, the last legal challenge to segregation in Ypsilanti was 1978. So pretty recently. I was still, I was alive for sure. But this is all the way back in 1919. Now, when is Martin Luther King born? Anybody know? 
This is before Martin Luther King is born, everybody. So we're talking about, you know, when you think of the Civil Rights Movement, think this is way before it. So this is a segregated school, but Bernice and her brother Herman Kersey are really important in the community. And he, if you look here, she's about 22, 23 years old, a very young woman. She is chosen by the community to lead the campaign to close this school because it's segregated. So she's leading the campaign to close the school she teaches at because it's a segregated school. And they want to open up a new school that's not segregated anymore. So she will, in, and this is 1917, 18, and 19. So this is, when is Brown versus Board of Education? 54 or something like that? This is 30 years before the Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education case around segregation in schooling. And there's a campaign in Ypsilanti, very, very early NAACP chapter. And she and her brother are led, uh, lead that campaign, and they win in court. Now, Ypsilanti will get resegregated just a few years later, but her and her brother actually win the court cases. Ypsilanti schools are judged as a violation of the civil rights codes of the state in the, in the 19-teens, 20s, and the school is actually shut down. They won this victory. Now, it will be reversed a few years later, unfortunately. But the Kersey family is like, remember me saying that families come back from Canada? Well, they came back from Canada about 1870, 1880, and they settled on First Avenue. And there's a little pink house on First Avenue, right when you get on, I think it's 329 First, it's on your left-hand side, and that is the home that Bernice uh, and her, uh, her father built, James Henry Kersey. And Bernice's niece, Rolanda Kersey still lives in that house. So that house has been there 120 years or more. It was built by James Henry Kersey, whose family were deeply involved in all this underground railroad business, then come to Canada, then come to Ipsy. Bernice and Nina and Herman all grew up in that house. And Rolanda Kersey, uh, Nina is still living there. She's nearly 100 years old. We are gonna go visit her and ask her questions about her remarkable life. And she's still, the pictures that her grandfather put up on the wall in 1880 when he came from Canada are still in the same place on the walls. So when you guys walk in there, I want you to be, I want you to treat it with respect, but look all around you because it's like a museum that somebody lives in for Ypsilanti's African American community. Okay, you guys all have heard of Rosa Parks? Here's our Rosa Parks. This is Marguerite Eaglin. During the period of the Martin Luther King times and the civil rights struggle, the leader of the civil rights struggle in Ypsilanti was a woman. It was Marguerite Eaglin. And she must have been something because when she was a young woman, her and her new husband Simon lived in Texas. And during the 1940s, they just decided to hitchhike to Ypsilanti. And here they stayed. So they just got out of town, hitchhiked to Ypsilanti. She becomes, uh, she grads, graduates EMU in 1953. And she starts working down at Perry School or Harriet Street School. And she starts early childhood development programs that would become what's called Head Start. So it's really important um, programs for young children around the country. She becomes the chairperson at Ipsy's Human Relations Commission. She would go on to counsel at Washington Community College. She's elected uh, president of the, she founds the union for workers at Washington Community College and is elected president there. Uh, and eventually becomes faculty union president. Uh, she's a member of the Palm Leaf Club and the Voguettes. After retirement, Margaret was extremely active. I just want you to know that this is spelled wrong. So it's E. Glenn, not E. Lynn. And her husband, Simon, is still alive. He's almost 100 years old as well. And he shared all of this history with Marguerite. And whenever I talk to old timers about the 50s and 60s in Ypsilanti, this is the name that comes up almost more than any other. She was really at the center of the, all of our civil rights activities, all of our campaigns to desegregate housing, to get people jobs, all of that, Marguerite was at the center of. Okay, Carolyn King. Now, believe it or not, I think this might be the most famous story about women in Ypsilanti. And this happens in 1973. And uh, did anybody here play Little League in Ypsilanti? Anybody? All my nephews played Little League. So what happens is, remember, Little League is just for boys. It's just for boys. But Carolyn, now remember, this is the early 70s. So this is when there's the Equal Rights Amendment movement. There's the women's movement. There's the feminist movement. So even though she's only 12 or 13 years old, this is the world she's living in. This Women can do things that men can do. Why can't we do things that men can do, right? 
So as this 12 or 13 year old girl, she doesn't need to be told she can't play, she's a girl and she can't play baseball. She just thinks she can play baseball. She's not political, she just thinks she can play baseball because she's growing up in this environment where women are saying, hey, we can do anything that you guys can do. We want to be able to do anything. So this little girl demands to play baseball on the Little League team, and she's good enough that the Little League local Ypsilanti says, yeah, you can definitely play on us. But Little League nationally says, no girls allowed. So they ban Ypsilanti's Little League team from participating, the Orioles. And so what happens is the city and the Little League here fights that. Our mayor at the time was an African. We've had two African-American mayors here at Ypsilanti, and the mayor at that time was a man named George Goodman. And George Goodman led the campaign to take Little League nationally to court so that Carolyn could play. And on May 10th, 1973, when every newspaper and every channel of television with their cameras here in Ypsilanti, you guys know where Candy Cane Park is? Candy Cane Park? Uh, she took the field at Candy Cane Park and played. And what happened at following this, and everybody took, here she is, all these pictures of her, what happened is this leads to legal challenges that, that will break down gender barriers to girls in all school uh, sporting activities, something called Title IX. It's not a direct from her, but it's, she's part of this thing that leads to it. And so one of the things that happens is Little League then, and all sports are going to have to, you have to have access for girls. So if you have a Little League team, girls have to be able to join it, or you have to at least have a girls team. If you have a soccer team, Girls have to be able to join it, or you have to have a girls' team. Be able, that's what happens. And that's because, in part, a 12-year-old Ypsilanti girl just wanted to play baseball. She just wanted to play baseball and couldn't figure out why she couldn't play baseball. Here she is. She uh, throws out the first pitch still at uh, the opening of Little League games here in Ypsilanti. And there's a, a movie you can see on YouTube about her. Um, what is it called, Laura? The girl in center field, or... Something like that. If you look up Ypsilanti Carolyn King, you can watch a YouTube video about her. But we've been talking about all of these women's and women's rights movement and women's history. This is probably the most famous event connected with women that ever happened in Ypsilanti because it was on every newspaper. It was on all the news channels at the time. Um, but it's important sort of culturally, but you know, I talked to her and she was just like, I just wanted to play baseball. She didn't even think about it it as a real political event or, or breaking barriers or anything. She just wanted to play baseball. And I think that's so much what we're looking at with these women. There are barriers set up all the time for these women, and they, they negotiate those barriers. They either work around the barriers, they bust through the barriers, they accept the barriers and are mad at the barriers, but they're always constantly having to deal with barriers that men don't have to deal with, right? So there's additional things that women have to overcome that men don't have to overcome. So when did women get their rights? Do women have all their rights today? No. So this is unfinished business. Unfinished business for women's rights. We're going to honor people like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Isis Stewart, Bernice Kersey. We can finish the work they started. We can be part of the history that they have left us. So are there any questions or comments on this? I have books of photographs from, mainly from the African American community from Ypsilanti. You guys are welcome to look. You guys have comments? Thank you guys so much.